When there's an imbalance in power in the relationship, then the relationship stagnates. It can't grow, it can't evolve, and the people in it also stagnate as well. So we're here today to talk about power imbalances and inside of relationships. And so this doesn't necessarily mean a romantic relationship. It can be between friends, between family members, in, in, you know, between parent, child, siblings, cousins, right? Work, coworkers, peers, employers, employees. Anywhere there's a relationship, there's the potential for a power imbalance. And the truth is that inside of every relationship, just as there is in any person, any individual person, there is potential to be manifested. There is the possibility of the blossoming of a person's uniqueness and individuality in the world. And so as that is the case for individuals, so is it also the case for relationships, partnerships, any collective of two or more people. And this of course applies not to just two people, but three, five, 10, a hundred, a town, a city, a state, a province, a country. So we're concerned here with the business of exploring that potential, creating a pathway for that potential to be manifested. And so to do that, we need to discover and dissolve any power imbalances that there are between the people. This is, in one manner of speaking, very simple. It's a very simple matter. The, uh, the solution is just, it's right there. We all know exactly what to do. The part that makes it tricky is that in order to reestablish, to rebalance the power in the relationship, you have to touch upon the very structure of the relationship itself. And that can be tricky. And depending on how important this relationship is, so say if it were a marriage to make it one of the most important relationships, then touching on the actual foundation of it, the actual bones of it, is really threatening. Because to speak really bluntly, the structure needs to be reconstituted. It needs to be redone. It needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. So it needs to go through a sort of death and dying process in order to go into a reincarnation process. But when you go into death, as is the case with any death, there's an opaqueness about it. We don't know what we're going to get on the other side. We just can't see it from this vantage. And so, and so that makes us a little scared to do it. And that creates a lot of fear around restructuring power. So that's what we're going to cover today. That's what we're going to get into. So my name is Brent and I'm a coach. I'm a healer and an intuitive. And I work with people one-on-one -on -one in groups to help them discover power, to get clear on why they're here and to get into this business of doing your most important work and doing it consistently faithfully, productively, and with flow. If that's up your alley, I have a handful of offerings, especially if you're catching this in September, I have a flow state coaching package available. Information is available for that below. And I also run the Sovereign Creators Collective, which is a coaching group where we talk about similar themes with a, a greater emphasis on power and leadership as we go into these crazy uncertain times, finding leadership and empowerment on our own without having to uh, wait for it from other people, and without having to wait around for something to happen, to be the change maker, to be the active agent in the world. So if that's up your alley too, we would love to have you. And there's a link for that below too. So onward with power imbalances. So how do you know if you are in a power imbalance? Well, one way of viewing it is from the perspective of maturity, immaturity, maturity. And so what I mean here is, you know, imagine, you know, a relationship that you're in and who shows up more or less as their best version, as the best version of themselves and who shows up as a less good, a less mature version of themselves. So typically in a power imbalance, one person is free to just act however they want, say whatever they want, make claims, make accusations. They can, um, you know, put you know, walk into your house with their shoes on, to speak figuratively. Um, they, uh, they're not terribly concerned about upsetting you or offending you. 
this would represent a power imbalance. And so you, if you're on the butt end, right, if you're on the disempowered end of that spectrum, then your position is usually one of enduring. So you're enduring this person, you're waiting it out, you're kind of painting a smile on your face, or you're pretending everything's good, and just waiting for them to be done with what they're doing, waiting to get out through the other side of it. And this also comes with a sense of saying, um, like, it's okay, you know, like, I don't mind, it's not that bad, it's okay when they do this, I know what they mean, I know they're not being serious when they say this, um, it's all in good fun, and generally buying into making excuses or making justifications for this behavior and why it's okay to put up with this behavior over time. Underneath, of course, what holds the power imbalance in place is a sense of intimidation. Now, so going into this, and as I speak to you, I realize that I'm not able to speak to you individually and I'm not able to learn about the exact nuances of your relationship. And I expect for you, there is a 99% chance that within the relationship, even if there is a power imbalance that you are safe and you're good and everything's fine and there's no real threat to your well-being or safety, right? But of course, a power imbalance can be very extreme. It, you know, it has been, it can be historically, it can be now. And so if you find yourself in a relationship where there is a very extreme power imbalance, where like if you were to speak or behave in a certain way that you would be, your safety would be threatened. Like somebody could hurt you or do damage to your property or even do undue damage to your emotional body, like just be overly mean or abusive to you. Then, then this conversation that I'm getting into doesn't actually apply to you. Your job is to get out of there. Your job is to make yourself safe and to put yourself in the presence of people that you trust so that you know that you're well and you can create a situation for yourself that's safe and build up from there. So to get out of an unsafe situation ASAP, as soon as humanly possible. So with that said then, I'm speaking to you with the assumption that you are safe. And so even, even if you still feel a sense of intimidation inside of this relationship with this other person, if I were to ask you on the most you know rational, realistic, objective kind of perspective, if I were to ask you from this perspective, like, are you safe and nobody's going to hurt you or hit you or do any sort of damage to you or, or your property or kin, and you say and you say to me like oh no like for sure for sure it's all in control like you know nothing like that's going to happen then let us proceed with this conversation and let's talk about how to dissolve the power imbalance so very good so returning to this idea then of intimidation so by definition now that we've proceeded into this part of the conversation what this also means is that the intimidation itself doesn't point to anything so the idea behind a threat or intimidation is that, you know, if you do the wrong thing, then a consequence is going to happen that would be really bad, right? That's what it means. But generally, in a space such as this, with no actual follow through, with no actual real thing on the other end of that threat, then what you end up with is a sort of an infinite regress of threats. So it's just a th threat that this person will threaten you with more threats, right? You know, this person, <laughs> there's a threat, there's sort of like intimidation where like, if you come out of line, I'm going to intimi intimidate you with my intimidation, right? So there's a sense of, of bravado, there's a sense of, um, of sort of puffing up our chest of making making ourselves look large the way certain animals do in the animal kingdom, um, but w there's really nothing there behind it. But the whole game of the power imbalance, and we can indeed see it as a game. The game of the power imbalance is held together by intimidation, and so even if you're skeptical now still about this like intimidation piece, here's like here's how you can check it for yourself. Here's how you can verify. It's like what is there in you? that you would just love to say to this other person, where if you were to say it, if you were to like speak your truth and stand in your truth and deliver the message that's just in your heart to deliver, 
in such a way where you don't take it back and you're not threatened away from saying it? Like, what would you say? What would that message be? So just like take a moment to consider it. And now consider your willingness to say this. And how does that feel? Does that feel intimidating? Does that feel threatening? And the answer is probably yes. And and you would say to yourself maybe something like, well, you know, this person would just blow up. You know, another one is this person can't handle the truth. Like they'll just, they'll blow up. They'll get upset. It'll turn into a big thing. Um, you know, I don't want to make waves. I don't want to rock the boat. It's going to be so much more trouble than it's worth. And here, here's a general chorus of people who stay in the disempowered butt end of the relationship is they say, it's not worth it. It's just easier to play along. Does this sound familiar at all? It's just easier to play along. I'll just do what they want and get it. It'll be just, it'll just take a minute and then I'll be done with and get on to the next thing. But that's the game. That's the game and that's the intimidation. So the way the incentive structures are set up to keep this game going, they are, they're different from both sides. And so the first thing that I really want to impress upon you here as we go about addressing power imbalances is that the person with the power, the person who gets to show up as their childish self, this person is playing a game that is benefiting them and they're happy for it to keep going forever. So in other words, the status quo, the structure of your relationship as it is right now works for them. It works for that person and they want to keep it going. And so either unconsciously, subconsciously, or consciously, they know about the power that they have and they know about their ability to manipulate you and to keep everything going as it is. And so they use that sense of fear or intimidation to keep everything going. Now, by contrast, you are not playing a sustainable game. You are playing a diminishing returns game where with every progressive day and hour that you are inside of the structure of this relationship, the space that you're in gets tighter and tighter and more constricted. It gets less and less comfortable. It feels less and less authentic. And there's a frustration and a resentment, if you're being honest, a resentment that mounts, that grows uh, larger and larger. Because of the intimidation and because of just the fear around restructuring the relationship, we are unwilling to acknowledge usually the resentment and the frustration. We don't want to acknowledge that it's there. And so we pretend that it's not there. And I've been in situations, I've been in a lot of like one-on-one -on -one talks with people about exactly this and, and, and getting the person that I'm speaking to, to even acknowledge their resentment and frustration can be really difficult because there's such a denial about it because there's such an unwillingness for it to be there. Because once we admit that there's mounting, mounting resentment and frustration that just gets larger and larger over time and is showing no signs of going back the other way, then it, you know, then we have to admit basically we have a problem on our hands and that a change needs to be made and we don't usually want to admit that to ourselves. So that's the nature of the game. So the person with power wants to keep it going. The person without power wants to stop it as soon as possible. And so therefore it falls on the person outside of power to find a way to rebalance the power structure. So there's a couple things that we need to recognize in order to, uh, to summon the courage that we need in order to do this rebalancing, because courage really is required for this. First of all, when it becomes clear beyond any shadow of a doubt at all that it's only getting worse for you over time, 
and that there's no change that's going to happen over the horizon. And the game of waiting for the other person to wake up and become a more mature version of themselves, this is a losing game. Like, it's just the likelihood of it happening is just extremely unlikely. Because why should it happen? You know, when we're, when we're in a position of power, there's no impetus to change. It's just too comfortable. It's too nice. So that, that's the first thing. It just, it falls on you. It's only going to come from you. And if it doesn't happen by you, it's never going to happen. And so you have to face with the prospect of it being like this basically forever. Unless, of course, the relationship ends. That would be a different thing as well. And, you know, maybe that is the ticket. Who knows? That it's a decision for you to make. Now, the other one is that the possibility, as we were discussing a little earlier, the potential of the relationship itself can become actualized through the the rebalancing of power. And so that is a possibility that comes online that that it's you know whereas before the person with power has all of the space they can spread out, they can be themselves, they can run their mouth, they don't have to check themselves, they don't have to be polite, and whereas the person without power has no space and it's just like, you know, just taking up as little amount of space as possible. When the power is rebalanced, then everybody gets space. And, and there's a really cool mixture of being, of being polite and courteous, but also having room to move. This brings me to an important point where it's like, when a person is in power, one of their biggest complaints when it comes to coming out of power is, I don't want to be restricted in my movements. I don't want to be told what to say. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to wear or whatever. I don't, you know, I want to be free to do whatever I want whenever I want. And and really this is a lower form of freedom. Not all freedoms are the same. And when the power is rebalanced, there's a freedom now not to just bleh, like not just do whatever you want, say whatever you want, but freedom to speak from your heart and freedom to be authentic and freedom to be yourself and be comfortable as yourself. And this is for both people in the relationship once the power is redistributed. So that's really cool. So good. So now we can talk about what it takes to actually redistribute the power, how to actually reset the relationship. And so, you know, as I was alluding to before, it's quite simple and it goes like this. You speak truth to power. You speak truth to power. This is a very poignant phrase and this will be your guiding light as you go through. Everything that's false, just to speak archetypally for a minute, everything that is false cannot withstand truth. What happens to falsehood in the presence of truth is the exact same thing as what happens to darkness in the presence of light. Once you turn on the lights in a room, then the darkness just yields. It's just gone. It just goes away. And and especially in the case of truth, which is different from, say, an electric light, Once truth is spoken, there's a permanent quality. So it's not like in a room where the darkness comes back. In this case, falsehood is dispelled by truth. And when there's a power imbalance in the relationship, it's sort of a false structure. You can see it that way. It's held on a false premise that's held in place by the person with power. It's like a balloon that can easily be punctured. So remember when I was asking you a little earlier about what's something that you could say to the person with whom you're in the relationship that you could, you know, you would, it would have a bubble bursting effect around it where it would just rock the boat. Like notice how your one phrase has the power to upset everything and, and make the energy wonky and intimidating and overwhelming and enough so that you just don't want to do it. Notice how much power is coded into a little phrase like that. The, when a phrase or one or two phrases has a catalytic power about it, that's how you know it's truth. As opposed to 
language that doesn't have a lot of truth about it, that's the kind of language in general that you have to really hammer on. You have to say it again and again. You have to kind of hypnotize people with it. You have to sort of coerce them into believing it. That's how you know what you're saying does not have power, right? Truth has power. Truth, when you hear truth, truth affects your body. What I've also noticed about telling truth is that when a person hears truth that they don't want to hear, then um, the person in power will almost request that you unsay it. There will be this feeling of like, no, no, take it back. No, 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 you don't mean it. No, 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 that's not how it is. And, and there's and what they want is for you to unsay it or disavow what you said so that we can go back to how it is. But if you've ever had the experience of telling the truth and 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 you like just through coercion or intimidation, you've been forced to kind of like unsay it or pretend like you didn't say it or like we're going to pretend like it's not the case. It feels even worse, right? It feels kind of janky. It's like, bleh, right? So the whole key is speaking truth to power, just saying the thing that pushes the first domino over and then standing in that truth. Now, here's the key is that the intimidation to be intimidated with more intimidation, the threat of being threatened by more threats is at its very core, as we were discussing, is nothing. It's smoke, it's vapor, it's fog it it looks like something but is essentially nothing it's just energy and so the key is to know this as you stand in your power because you when you know this what i'm sharing with you here then intimidation is no longer anything to be threatened by it's nothing to be afraid of we can see this i hope i'm making this really clear it's like there's nothing substantiated by it and so whatever that is it's like it's the equivalent of being like say eight years old and you're afraid of the monster under the bed and so when you're ready to be done of this drama of maybe there's a monster under the bed you look under the bed you say, okay, I'm ready for the intimidation. Give me the intimidation. And there's a sense, very importantly, of you're not, you're not doing it in sort of like an attack mode, nor are you doing it in a fighting mode, but you're doing it where you are standing still in your power. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was afraid of my basement in my house growing up because it was just a big, dark basement. And, uh, and so I would, you know, turn on the lights if I had to go retrieve something from the basement, say. Um, but sometimes if I, um, if I wanted something from the basement to bring it back up and it was dark, I would challenge myself a little bit to just, like, go and get the thing and run. But what I noticed is that I would, like, I would run and get the thing and I'd go as fast as I could. And I remember feeling, like, my last little, like, nip of fear as I'd get up to the very top as if whatever it was that I was afraid of would get me just as I was about to escape. And so I'd, ah, like I'd feel like uh, there'd be a little bit of extra sprite in my step as I came out of there. So it occurred to me on some level, not like, not with the clarity that I'm sharing with you now, but on some level, I knew that as long as I kept doing it this way, I was going to stay afraid. And then it became clear that if I wanted to not be afraid of the dark basement, then what I had to do was go down there and be still to be still and to not permit myself to be moved by fear and instead permit fear to move while I'm still. And so I would, I, so I went, I remember this, I went into like this, I, I looked for the scariest place to stand in, in the basement. And I went and I stood right there and it was sincerely scary. I, I like, I was just looking around, looking for things moving, or if I felt any like, you know, ghosty ghosties or spirits or demons or whatever. I just kind of, I, I, I felt around, I was open, I was receptive to it. And I breathed in and I breathed out and I breathed in and I breathed out and there was all this fear moving in me and it was okay. It was totally okay because I had known, I decided ahead of time that I was safe and I knew I was safe. So you can see now why, like that important caveat I had in the beginning. It's like, we know discerning on the rational top level 
am I safe versus am I unsafe? We need to decide that on the very top level so that if we decide that I'm definitely safe, we can plunge into this territory of feeling unsafe or like suspecting I might be unsafe, right? So in other words, you know, setting up the conditions to safely experience unsafety. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I think it does. So that's what I was doing. That's exactly what I was doing in the basement, just being very, very still. And then what did I notice? Well, you know exactly what happens. Eventually the movement of fear slows down. And then now there's actually no hurry to leave the basement. There's no hurry. And so then of my own accord, I move out of the basement because I have a life to live. And so I get on with what I'm getting on with. And then the, it was never the same ever since then. And then maybe still like, there's little flickers of fear, right? But the main body of fear is gone. And then the process of dissolving fear remains the same. That's the process of dissolving fear, which of course is the same as the process of dissolving intimidation and threat. These all being just different variations of fear, right? So this is what I'm describing, turning on the lights in the basement. Now, now, so here's something else to consider is that, and forgive me, I forget if I mentioned this in the very beginning, but when, when we're addressing the fear structures in a relationship that can otherwise be a loving and functional relationship. So like the relationship can otherwise be solid and good and loving and effective. And, and like for all re all intents and purposes, it's in everybody's best interest to keep the relationship together, whatever it is. But there's just like little pockets of power and balances. Like it can totally be like that can totally function that way. So, but it nevertheless means that you are touching on the structure of the relationship to the degree that there's intimidation in the relationship. Like that's the degree to which the foundation of that relationship is being touched. And so there's this other fear of like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen when I do this. And, and so there is, there is this death process that I was referring to where, where, when you signal that you're no longer willing to be intimidated and you signal that you're willing to experience whatever it is behind all these threats where it's like, okay, like, yeah, like I'm not, I'm, I said the thing, I'm not going to unsay it. I'm going to stand in my truth. I will not be provoked to fight or run away. I will just stay here at center and allow whatever experience is happening to happen. Then then there's a whole movement of energy and it can be incredibly surreal. It can be very surreal and, and, and kind of, and it can feel sometimes even like a tornado where you just have to kind of just stay present and stay conscious as you witness the entire thing happening. There will of course be doubt as well. Oh my God. Oh, did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? And, and to the doubt, there's a very easy answer. It's like just just run this idea by your body of unsaying the true thing you said and going back to where you came from. Your body will go, no. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you're to choose between, you know, the frying pan or the pot, you know, out of the frying pan and into the pot, it's like, well, at least let's do something new for crying out sakes. Let's try something new. So anyway, so, so there's an energy tornado and then, and then like, like again, depending on the nature of the relationship, there may not necessarily be a guarantee that the relationship will endure this. Because again, we're going through a death. And so, so for a minute, for the blink of an eye, the relationship has died and there is no relationship. And what's left over is the degree of of basic attraction there is between these two people. Again, marriage, friendship, business partnership, whatever, the degree of attraction that's there. And if the degree of attraction is still there, then a new relationship will automatically, organically be re reconstituted. And, and the, the, the intimidation that the relationship was previously based upon will no longer be there. It's really cool. So I guess maybe one more thing to say on this is like what you've just learned here is, is just 
so you can you can you can change everything with this. You can change your whole life with this, depending on where you're starting from. Like this is this is very very cool stuff, and and I and I you know this whole issue of of rebalancing power, of setting boundaries, which is this is everything I'm sharing here is just setting boundaries. It's another way of putting it. This may not necessarily come naturally to you. If I'm addressing you and if you're following this and it means you're in the butt end of a, at the disempowered end of a relationship, then it means that you may not be so inclined for conflict. You know, you may not be so inclined to um, be um, in disagreement with people and, you know, maybe you like myself have a penchant for people pleasing and this is something this is a kind of an end that this is something you've uh, this is a way that you've been for a while in a way that you're sort of uh, configured to be i want you to know that you can learn this you absolutely can learn this and you absolutely can do this it this is absolutely learnable for you if if i've managed to learn this you can absolutely manage to learn this this is absolutely doable for you so i want to mention that and then and then there's one more thing here we go there's nothing wrong with with either of you that it came to be this way a power imbalance generally comes into being when there's a tacit agreement between the two people of one person saying, I'm going to mistreat you. I'm going to be disrespectful to you. And the other person being like, okay, I'm going to allow you to disrespect me. I'm going to allow you to mistreat me. And this is not something that's said with one's words, but by continuing to remain in the relationship and, and allowing the person to mistreat one. And so, and so I, you know, this isn't to, this isn't victim shaming. This isn't victim blaming, but this is um, this is to say this is how this sort of thing comes into being, and it continues to be this way until we redo it, until we redo the whole thing. And so I'm saying this so that when it comes time for you to rebalance the power in your relationship, you'll get the best results if you don't see the other person as a bad guy not see the other person as actually a bully, even if that's the way that they were acting. That instead, what has happened is two characters have come together to create a bully relationship. And, and to get the smoothest and cleanest and quickest results, to get the highest quality results, you achieve that by seeing the person who has all the power in the relationship as an unwitting character themselves, as a basically innocent being that's been caught in an unconscious role. And so the line that you're walking now is one of being of speaking truth to power and standing in that truth without unsaying it, but having a certain understanding that this is also, in their own way, an incredibly difficult thing for them to go through too. And you you can hold space for it. And don't don't coddle them. You don't have to coddle them. You don't have to like nurse them. You don't have to feel bad for them even. But you can hold space where it's like you, your, your basic silent intuitive knowing is, this is hard for me and this is hard for you. And I'm doing this for us. I'm doing this so that we can awaken out of our childish, immature roles, characters, and so that the potential of the relationship can be actualized. So that's it. That is power imbalances in the relationship, redistributing the power. Speak truth to power, stand in it, do it. You can do it in a way that's respectful and loving and knowing that that both of you are about to move out of stagnation and move forward into bigger and better things. Please hit like on the video if you enjoyed. Leave a comment if you have any ideas of any cool things are occurring to you, any disagreements, uh, any problems with this. I'd be very grateful to hear them. Check out my one-on-one -on -one coaching offerings. Check out the Sovereign Creators Collective. Catch you on the next one.